Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Women in the Taliban's Afghanistan. My name is Matt Kokonos, and I'm the coordinator of the Negotiation Task Force at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies here at Harvard University. It's my pleasure to introduce our host and moderator of today's event, Farah Abbas. Farah is a fellow with the Davis Center's Negotiation Task Force and a specialist on Afghan affairs. She served in senior government positions, representing Afghanistan in international negotiations and conferences. Most recently, she served as Director of Programs at the Office of National Security Council, and prior to that as Deputy Director General for International Relations, where she advanced the government's foreign and security policies. She's a graduate of Stanford University with a Master of Arts in International Policy Studies with a focus on international security and cooperation. Farah, please take it away. Thank you, Matt, and hello to everyone. I welcome you all to a timely and important panel discussion on women in Taliban's Afghanistan. In the preceding 20 years, until the Taliban takeover last August, Afghanistan had made major gains in women's rights and access, in health and maternal care, in education, in the labor market, and public and political life. Since coming to power, the Taliban have institutionalized large-scale and systematic gender-based discrimination and violence against women and girls that are steadily erasing them from public life. The new regime has silenced women protesters with arbitrary detention, closed the Ministry of Public Affair, uh, of Women's Affairs, forbidden women from working in the public sector, forbidden women from traveling without a male companion, and the list goes on. Last month, to widespread condemnation, the Taliban announced continuation of their ban on teenage girls from attending school. Today marks 209 days of that ban. Girls over the age of 12 continue to be deprived from attending schools, making Afghanistan the only country in the world to forbid girls from getting an education, which is a basic human right. As a result of these policies, girls are under increased risk of exploitation, including child and forced marriages. Women are reported to be at a higher risk for domestic violence. Exacerbating the situation of women and girls in Afghanistan is the humanitarian crisis and threats of a total economic collapse. Economic challenges have been empirically shown to disproportionately harm women and female-headed households. Although aid has trickled in, the Taliban government is still not diplomatically recognized and most of its leadership is under international sanctions, making foreign influence limited. How are women and girls coping in this harsh reality they find themselves in? What more can be expected of the Taliban? Will they reverse course or continue to further restricting women and girls? What influence and leverage does the US, the West, UN and human rights defenders have? Should they continue to engage the group or shun them as they have since the school ban? Uh, international isolation will ultimately hurt Afghan citizens for far more than uh, the new government. And what internal pressures can the Afghan population employ to resist these draconian and regressive policies? Joining me today to discuss these and other questions is a fascinating and a truly iconic panel. I encourage our audience to look our speakers up online and to read their inspiring stories. In no particular order, we have Dr. Seema Samar. Dr. Samar is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, renowned human rights advocate, and an identified global influential female figure. She was the chair of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, the country's first vice president, and the first minister of women's affairs. Dr. Samar also served as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Sudan. She's the founder of Shahada, an NGO that operates 58 middle and high schools 
12 clinics and four hospitals in Afghanistan and Pakistan, with a particular focus on women and girls. Next, we have Sharzad Akbar. She's a human rights activist from Afghanistan, currently in exile, with a diverse professional background. Her work experience spans from establishing and running a consultancy firm in Kabul, supporting Afghan civil society and media in her role as the country director of Open Society Afghanistan, to working with the government on development issues, and most recently, leading Afghanistan's Independent Human Rights Commission. Sharzad is a graduate of Oxford University and Smith College. Uh, Heather Barr uh, is an Associate Director of Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. She has researched human rights in various countries, including Afghanistan, and uh, she joined Human Rights Watch in 2011 in Kabul after working for the United Nations on Human Rights and Legal Reforms in various countries in Asia. She's a graduate of London School of Economics and Columbia University School of Law. Last, we have Pashtana Durrani, who is a visiting fellow at Wellesley College. She's an Afghan human rights activist and community development expert whose focus is girls' education. Pashtana is the founder of Learn Afghanistan that provides education to girls and boys through a distributed network of tablet computers using an offline platform. Through Learn, she has educated 7,000 children in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and trained more than 80 teachers. Pashtana was named an education champion by the Malala Fund and is one of BBC's 100 influential women in 2021. In the next hour, our speakers will share their insights and answer questions about the precarious situation for women and girls in Afghanistan. In the last 20, uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes of the session, we'll take some of the audience questions. So please submit your questions in the chat box. I wanna start off by giving each one of our speakers a chance to comment on the situation for women and girls in Afghanistan. So let me start with you, Sharzad. How are women and girls coping in this harsh reality? What is to be expected of the Taliban next vis-a-vis uh, -vis their social policies on women and girls? Thank you, Farjan. Greetings to all. I'm really honored to be part of this panel and this discussion. It's also, of course, heartbreaking to be discussing the situation for, uh, for women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, I think the latest um, blow to women's rights in Afghanistan was in March, as we all remember, when on March 23rd, uh, when um, um, young women and girls were turned away from school gates, uh, despite uh, promises that Taliban uh, made. Um, it, uh, we all felt immense pain that uh, that day, but that pain is fresh every day because, as you also uh, spoke earlier, um, Afghan girls cannot go to school throughout um, secondary school and high school across Afghanistan till this day with no clarity about when they might be able to go to school again. This has far-reaching implications for future of Afghanistan as a very poor conflict-ridden country. Um, and of course, it has far reaching implications for the lives of these girls who have been deprived of the education for more than 200 days. Um, they have no sense of when they might be able to go to school and if they do, and if they go to university, what areas and sectors will they be allowed to work in? This is a situation that does not exist in any other country in the world, including Islamic countries. Many Muslim uh, religious scholars and leaders of Islamic countries, including leaders of the countries in the region who are perceived to be close to Taliban, have called on the Taliban to reverse the ban and have called the situation unacceptable. But we haven't seen any positive signs that the ban will be reversed. Of course, reversing the ban on girls' education is just a first step in a very long journey of regaining some of the legal rights of women that they had prior to August 15th and fall of Kabul to Taliban. We have to remember that Afghan women currently in Afghanistan are 
deprived of not only the right to education, but to free movement, employment in many sectors, except health and education, and um, uh, po political participation. So their whole range of fundamental human rights has been violated, uh, has been oppressed. Female protesters, the only force really who is actively and uh, regularly challenging Taliban inside Afghanistan is the women protesters. They have been in the past few months, we have seen a horrific trend of threats, intimidation, abductions, arrests, um, allegations of torture and, um, and mistreatment and detention, release upon uh, securing forced confessions and forced so-called guarantee letters so that women do not protest again and do not speak uh, about the situation uh, again or do not talk to the media again. So uh, there was initially some level of, I would say, optimism, at least among some international actors that Taliban uh, are very different this time or somewhat different this time around because their own daughters, as we also hear on the news, are going to school uh, for some of them or pursuing an education and that they have lived you know, in different countries and they have been exposed to how women and men live in different Islamic countries and how different Islamic societies organize themselves. However, of course, as every day passes, we realize that this new Taliban is even more brutal in its tactics. The level of time and resources that Taliban spent while the, application, while the population is starving on crashing descent is absolutely mind boggling. They actually have their NDS unit or their National um, uh, Directorate of Security or Intelligence Unit going after individuals who post critical posts on social media, ordinary individuals, and threaten them to remove the posts and stop criticizing um, the so-called emirate. So their focus does not seem to be on any engagement, not only with an even international community, with the Afghan people and respecting the wishes and demands of Afghan people, including tribal elders, community elders, um, the Afghan women, the Afghan uh, media and civil society, but to control and police women, particularly, but the public as a whole. So right now, as I'm speaking to you, um, the only hope that I have actually is the Afghan uh, human rights community and Afghan civil society, both inside and outside the country, that continue to push. And I'm hoping that the Afghan civil society and human rights community inside and outside the country in the diaspora, that they will be the force to keep the attention on Afghanistan, international attention, because as we know also, international attention is quite flaky and keeps moving from one crisis to another crisis. And the biggest, um, one of the biggest um, tragedies could be for Afghanistan to be completely forgotten. And for many Afghans it already, particularly Afghan women who are and Afghan girls who haven't been able to go to school, it already feels that way. Uh, I'll stop there and happy to come back um, later if need be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharzad. Uh, you're right uh, to say that we need to keep the international attention on uh, this very important issue that uh, discriminates uh, against half of the population in Afghanistan. Uh, especially uh, right now uh, that we are competing in terms of that attention with the crisis in Ukraine and uh, uh, all of the other issues uh, going on in the world. And with that, I turn to Dr. Samar. Uh, can you please comment uh, on the situation uh, in Afghanistan? And, uh, and if you can also please tell us, what is it that the Taliban mean when they say that they will allow girls and women to exercise their rights uh, within Islamic law? Uh, can we really trust them after uh, all of these broken promises that they had made to us? Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, organizing this program and salam to everyone, of course. Uh, uh, good morning or good evening, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know where people are, from where the people are joining. <clears throat> the second point that I would like to mention is that I just passed my deep solidarity with Ukrainian, Ukraine people because what is going on there, it was happened in Afghanistan 43, 44 years ago. The aggression from the same kind of mentality and then it continues 
until today. So we have the Taliban as a result of that war, uh, by the way, because it was not, Afghanistan was not as Afghan, uh, is Afghanistan, the Afghanistan today. Uh, <clears throat> so in general, of course, the human rights situation is bad. It's not only for women, but it, it is really harsh on women. That is very, very clear. And, and you could see that the, the crisis was already in the country. There there's a, was crisis of governance. There was crisis, economical crisis in the country, which end up with the humanitarian crisis where the people, you see the families are selling their daughters in order to feed the, the rest of the, the family. And the um, third, of course, was because of the drought, because of the COVID itself, the country was already poor and now, uh, they are really in, in very, very difficult shape. The problem with the governance uh, of Taliban, Taliban doesn't have any policy for governance. What they do have every week and uh, twice a week, they come up with an order, for a new order on women. These are the ones that we knew before and they're the same people. They only change superficially. They keep saying that they are changed and they are not the one that we can trust because the, in the last three months before March 23rd, they were promising that they are going to open the schools. They are going to open the schools. And everybody was so hopeful. Everybody was clapping, including the international community, that the Taliban are changed. They are new Taliban. Uh, we saw that they are not new Taliban. And it is so difficult to, to explain the, the pain and the, um, the fear of, of millions of girls to live under that situation, to not have access to education. I think it, it is first time in, in our history that it's officially banned. Of course, it was not in Afghanistan, it was not very common, uh, maybe 70 years ago, that girls could go to schools, but this was not the situation at all. I mean, I keep saying that I gone to co-education school maybe 60 years ago or 58 years ago, something. But now the people are, are not able to, the, the girls are not able to go to school, let alone the co-education. I, I think there is some, some, some problem because they do not close down the, the private schools. So I don't know what is behind the whole thing, because maybe they get tax from the private school. That's why that they are not closing, and they're not closing the uh, private university as well. So Gavashad is running, although they have very small number of students, but they are running, and they are continuing their program. Of course, separation of boys and girls has has happened. Half of the students are in the morning, and half of the students in the afternoon but at least they are coming. So sometimes they come and, and harass them that way uh, you don't have proper hijab and so on. The other point that I would like to mention with coming Taliban in power in Afghanistan, the patriarchy actually is emboldened, got more power. Now it's not only Taliban, the male member of the family is trying to protect the female member of the family. And the, partially rightly, because they do, do not want their daughters to be uh, beaten up in the street or arrested or tortured or raped. But it gives a kind of a message to the, the male member in the society that, okay, it's back to male empowerment and male domination. So under the name of protection, it's not only in Afghanistan, unfortunately, they embolden the, the uh, patriarchy in, in our region and other countries. So as I said, that the, the situation is so dire that the people, the, um, I mean, families and mothers are selling their children. It's very, very difficult to do that. I mean, we cannot, I mean, when I see the photos, I cannot sleep. So I don't know what is the situation of that mother when they sell their children and how desperate she is. Uh, so the violence against women is increased, of course, not, I mean, uh, I would say that closure of schools and banning the education, girls' access to education 
should be counted as a war crime because it's war crime is not only rape. It is violation of human rights. And so massively, you know, for millions and millions. So that we should we should lobby for that. And that should be done. And the, the other part, which I said that the violence against women has really increased. Unfortunately, there is no mechanism to, to deal and protect them. The Human Rights Commission is closed. I just got a, um, a, a photo from the Bamiyan office full of uh, uh, our people and our army uh, tanks and, and uh, vehicles. Uh, and it turned to be a, um, a prison for Taliban. And the, the Ministry of Women's Affairs is not open. The uh, Elimination of Violence Against Women Prosecutor Office, which was at the Prosecutor Office or Family Response Unit of, of police stations, everything is closed. So practically women are back to that four walls of their houses and they have to bear every kind of uh, violence, unfortunately. So I think, uh, um, so that is the uh, that is unfortunately is the situation, and of course we all see that okay the the violence against women or pressure or oppression of women was not new in the country. It was not only Taliban, but the Taliban are the most extreme that they end up to gender apartheid completely. So I don't know why they are afraid. It's clear because they are afraid that they will be uh, their power will be reduced their control will be reduced. So I think that is uh, the other issue that I, I wanted to mention. I think we need to, to organize ourselves. The people of Afghanistan should be the main force for change. We saw different countries came to Afghanistan and could not change. And that should be the, within the country from the people in Afghanistan, but in an organized way. I mean, the, the protest in Bamiyan, for example, just to tear up and not to deserve their, their meeting is good, but not enough. And then those girls are threatened or asked for, for questioning. Uh, I, there's a conflict report, somebody is saying they are arrested, somebody is saying they are not arrested. And there's no mechanism to protect and follow up with them. It's only UN, but UN, we know, but I mean, they don't have um, the magic key for every question for a uh, solution for every problem in the country. I stop here, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Samar. Uh, I mean, uh, you have done uh, so much in your career and life uh, to advance various causes. And I just want to clarify uh, for our audience uh, that uh, Dr. Samara is also the founder of Gauharshad University in Kabul. And, uh, um, and with that, I would like to turn over to Heather. Um, can you talk about the human rights situation in Afghanistan? I mean, we have heard uh, reports that human rights defenders face intimidation, harassment, threats, violence, and even targeted killings. Uh, can you corroborate that? Yeah, I mean, we've been hearing about um the Taliban looking for human rights activists and searching for them and people hiding and moving from one house to another to try to um, escape being found and people being intimidated. And, um, you know, the, the attacks on the protesters have escalated over time. But from the beginning, we saw that, um, you know, people were searching for them after the protests and threatening them and trying to silence them. Um, <clears throat> so this has been happening all along. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to have clear information because another thing the Taliban has done is silence the, the Afghan media and the international media has mostly moved on and was mostly only in Kabul in the first place. So it's very hard to have clear information about what's happened, particularly in cases of um, killings and disappearances. Um, but, um, you know, we know that, I mean, sort of two things have happened at once. First, there's um, abusive actions by the Taliban, but then there's also this space that's kind of opened up 
um, in which um, other people, um, vigilantes or people who have a personal grudge against someone who, you know, felt held back um, because of the fear of being arrested, being prosecuted, being imprisoned um, in the past, and now they don't feel that fear anymore. And so they're feeling very free to engage in violence, especially if the, the person they want to um, engage in violence against is someone who is disfavored by the Taliban, which certainly applies to women's rights activists. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the international response to this situation. Um, you know, just kind of zooming back and thinking about Afghanistan right now from a global perspective. Human Rights Watch works on um, human rights issues in about 100 countries. Right now, Afghanistan is the most serious women's rights crisis in the world. And this is the most serious women's rights crisis since 1996. And what happened in 1996, of course, is that the Taliban took over Afghanistan for the last time. Um, last time. And so, um, you know, we really think that the whole world, every country in the world that cares about women's rights, which, um, you know, as, as you've pointed out, includes um, countries in this region, um, other countries in the OIC, et cetera, um, should be really um, making it a priority to try to resolve this, this crisis, this situation where, you know, there's one country in the world where girls are being denied education, when their women are being denied work. Um, and I don't think that we've seen the international response that this crisis merits um, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination at all. I think the international response has been poor. Um, and, you know, it relates to the fact that world leaders are mostly men. It relates to the fact that, you know, women's rights are not that much of a priority for most countries. Of course, the situation in Ukraine has highlighted some other dynamics, um, you know, and the extent to which, um, you know, of, of course, there are reasons that Ukraine is such a high priority, but we also, I think, can't help but see um, Islamophobia and racism influencing the extent to which Afghanistan is, is seen as less of a priority than Ukraine, and particularly the way that um, there's such a stark difference in the treatment of Afghan refugees versus Ukrainian refugees. Um, so, you know, and I just want to go back and, and talk about history for a moment, too, because um, I might be the only person on this panel who was living in New York on 9-11. And I remember very clearly how the images of Afghan women in burqas were used to sell this war to me as a U.S. voter, as a U.S. taxpayer. And so I think that in addition to caring about this crisis, because it's the most serious women's rights crisis in the world, we also... Um, our governments have an obligation to care about this crisis because they used Afghan women to sell this war and they spent 20 years promising, we will always stand beside you, we will always stand beside you. Um, and that's been a complete lie since August 15th, I think. So just to talk for a second about what, what could governments actually do when the Taliban are a difficult entity to deal with, you know, it's not it's not simple where you go and say to them that's not acceptable, and then they and then they stop doing it. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing that the international community can do. First of all, the treatment of refugees has been shameful, and this announcement by the UK today about how they're going to offshore process refugees in Rwanda is a shocking um, sort of further deterioration of what was already a a shockingly bad situation. Second of all, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, where 95% of people don't have enough to eat, and according to the UN, 100% of women-headed households don't have enough to eat, was created by the international community for the most part, particularly by the White House. And the fact that they are showing no urgency about resolving that is essentially them punishing all Afghans, particularly Afghan women and girls, because they're angry that they lost the war and they're angry at the Taliban. And that needs to stop immediately. Um, other things they need to do, they need to try everything they can to defend human rights defenders, such as these women protesters. They need to really, really keep an eye on their safety and well-being and scream when they're um, being abused in the ways that um, Shahrazad discussed. They need to keep funding um, Afghanistan and providing aid, but do it in really smart ways where they're doing things like funding alternative um, routes to education, which I imagine Pashtana might talk about. They need to be supporting the activists in the country. Um, I really appreciate your point, Shahrazad, about how that's the only hope that we can have is 
the, the work of activists within Afghanistan. They need to have the resources necessary to feed themselves and feed their families and do whatever work they can figure out how to do safely within the country. Um, and then, um, and then there, you know, there are ways that the Taliban can be pressured. The Taliban seem to be quite vain about their overseas trips and which meeting they got invited to and their photo ops with diplomats. So these might seem like silly ways to actually address a human rights crisis, but they do seem to be points of leverage. And I get really angry when I see, um, you know, after March 23rd, diplomats having a smiley photo op with the Taliban. And if they get on another private jet and tweet photos of themselves, I'm going to lose it completely, I tell you. And so the last thing I want to say is, um, Seema, you've talked about how these are not just human rights abuses, these are crimes. And that's true. So we've been waiting 12 years for the International Criminal Court to act on Afghanistan, and we're still waiting, but things are hopefully moving forward. And when they move forward, one of the things the International Criminal Court needs to be investigating, and we all need to be preserving evidence of, is gender persecution, which is a crime under the, the ICC's Rome Statute, and which could see some of these Taliban leaders um, in prison eventually. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Heather. I uh, really appreciate your um, uh, vocalness on these issues and your candidness. And I must say that I have liked your tweets whereby you have criticized these envoys for taking these diplomatic pictures with the uh, Taliban officials and just smiling. Although we know that the, the, the true story uh, is something completely different. Um, and, and I just also want to uh, say that I will come back to a lot of these points that uh, um, you all have made thus far. Um, and uh, just want to say that one of the reasons why Afghanistan has been stuck in this cycle of uh, conflict and violence and underdevelopment and poverty is because women have been excluded. Uh, and the past 20 years with um, a little bit of uh, participation by women and girls, I mean, we, 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 we achieved so much. Uh, and again, uh, those achievements are being erased right in front of our eyes. Um, and uh, so I would like to uh, talk to uh, or ask Pashtana about uh, uh, her insight and about her work educating girls. Um, I know just like all of you, when I woke up on March the 23rd and uh, saw uh, these tweets and posts that the Taliban had reversed their decision to allow girls to return to school, I uh, grew very emotional and it was, uh, um, I was having the very same feelings that I had on August 15 when the government collapsed. Uh, so uh, Pashtana, um, can you talk to us about that and, and uh, what more can be done to amplify your important work? Thank you so much, Peringis, and thank you everyone who just um, gave their insight. It's always amazing to share a panel with giants like Sherzad, Heather, and Sima Samar that I look up to so much, <laughs> just so you guys know. Um, as Heather highlighted, um, the last crisis in Afghanistan was in 96, and I was not born in 96. This is my first crisis. For my generation, for people like us who is educated in this new Afghanistan, who knows nothing about that Afghanistan, this is our first crisis. We don't know anything of that happened in the 90s, or at least we haven't experienced it. Today, as I talk to you, before that, I opened my Twitter. So here's a few things that people should know that today are happening in Afghanistan. Azim Azimi, a famous activist who uh, uh, had this uh, Afghan flag up, still missing. People say that he's transferred to uh, Pakistan. Some say he's transferred to other facilities. Women in Bamiyan who protested against the Taliban in that protest are still missing. Uh, women in Helmand are sent back home and beaten up because they were shopping without a mahram. Religious minorities like Sikhs are no more existent in Afghanistan. They are in India. The placement of women empowerment with male empowerment is right now the highlight of our stories when it comes to Afghanistan. 
Um, as I'm coming here, I saw the maktub that says, or the order that said, ban on neckties. So the priority for the government right now is ban on neckties. I know we are laughing about it, but that's like reality. People, the Taliban don't care about um, feeding the families who are poor right now, but there is a ban on neckties. There is ban on jeans. There's ban on how you dress. There's ban on how you travel, but there is no ban on making the uh, starving and malnourished hungry. Uh, right now, the focus is more on burqa. Right now, the focus is more on sanctions and how they can be lifted. And their lobbyists are actually actively lobbying for that. But there is no focus on what can be done in Afghanistan right now. So now coming back to what can be done and what's happening right now, I'm pretty sure if anyone knows about Afghanistan in August 15, um, majority of us have cried on that day or cried the following days. We lost everything that was happening in Afghanistan. Um, I was set to graduate in May. I was supposed to go on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, I was supposed to return back home. I was supposed to run for parliament, FYI. <laughs> and I was supposed to represent my own province. And I'm not ashamed to say that I had political ambitions because I remember in 2017, the first time I went to Kabul, I saw Dr. Samar on TV when she was actually uh, talking to UNSC. And I was like, God, I want to be that woman, you know, when I am that uh, in that uh, age. And today that's impossible for Afghan girls. That's impossible for our generation to be because we don't have any formal representation. We don't have any political representation, no diplomatic representation, no women workforce in Afghanistan. 30% of the workforce that the 20 years of capacity building was invested in, today that's not active anymore. Girls are no more in school. There is a chain that's being broken very strategically. No more girls in from grade six to grade 12 means no more graduate in, uh, from high school that will be entering the university and no more university graduates mean no more teachers, no more midwives, no more doctors, no more political representatives, no more civil society activists. And that breaks the chain for all the women in Afghanistan. So when we talk about Afghanistan right now, it's not just crisis. It's a country that is being set back from hundreds of years ago, because even hundred years ago, all four of us know that uh, Afghanistan had a woman uh, minister of education, Queen Soraya, was actually starting the first scholarship, uh, sending women to Turkey. Hundreds in ancient Afghanistan, there was Gohar Shad Begum, who was actually leading uh, the education sector in Afghanistan. So we are not uh, from dark ages. We had women in ancient Afghanistan, in modern Afghanistan, who have led the way. But right now, looking at how the international community is uh, responding and how, as Heather said, everyone goes and has a picture with them and how a few women just so highlight that come on twitter and talk about how the taliban are be a taliban 2.0 and we should engage with them some sometimes it actually robs me that uh, you know there is so much less honor in the fact that you would sell your own country women for just a political opportunity. And it breaks my heart that these are the people who are actually leading this conversation. But I'm also grateful to people like Sharzad, like Heather, like Seema Samar, who are leading this conversation and have been making the strides to make sure that women rights activists are highlighted, their work is highlighted, abuses are actually uh, reported. And at the same time, now coming to what we do in LEARN or what we, I have been doing so far, Post-August, I for one thought that everything is over and I cannot do anything. But then again, we have amazing women of Afghanistan to look up to. And in the 90s, one thing that I remember from the women of Afghanistan, the stories, was there were schools that were run like uh, Shabana, Shabana Basij Rasik, the founder of Sola, actually went to one of those schools and she is the leading educator in Afghanistan right now. And I was like, why not to us? We should do the same. We have technological experience right now. And we started with a school in Kandar. Today, I'm proud to say that we have have schools in Kandar, Kabul, Takhar, and Bamiyan, and we are on the next uh, stop is Faryab, Mazar, Hilman, and Nagarhar. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have 16 uh, digital schools in 16 provinces. So 
The goal is to make sure that we educate 100 women leaders per province, um, make sure that the communities reach out to us. All these schools that I just told you about, all of them are community led. We are helping them, we are collaborating with them. It's not a corporate project. Nobody has assigned any funding to this. It's us fundraising and sending funds back home, helping them, training them, and them leading the change. So yes, um, there's a lot to be said and done, but. I would like to start with the fact that God bless the women of Afghanistan, the activists of Afghanistan, and the communities of Afghanistan who still believe in making sure they, that their daughters show up to school every morning. So thank you. Thank you so much, Pashtana. I mean, uh, your work is just so important. Uh, uh, and all that you're doing to advance girls' rights and their education in Afghanistan. Um, I, I don't think at any other point in our history uh, was this more important as it is right now. Uh, and, and because this trend uh, that is happening in Afghanistan, it's just so terrifying. I mean, you do not let girls attend school. That means that next year there's not going to be any girls attending universities, and then we're not going to have any professional uh, working women in, in whatever field, including in education and health, as Sharzat uh, mentioned earlier, that that is the two areas that the, the Taliban allow women to work. Um, so uh, it, it just, it's, it's uh, baffling as to what is uh, going on. And uh, I just want to uh, highlight what you said uh, in that I am truly inspired by all four of you uh, 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 because you are the uh, true representatives and embodiment of strong Afghan women. Heather, you included, you are an honorary Afghan for all of the important work that you have done over the past decade. Um, and and um, I'm truly inspired by all of you, especially you, Dr. Samar, uh, because uh, as I said earlier, people should look you guys up online to, to read about your hardships and what you had to overcome. Uh, and with that, I want to turn over again to Sharzat. Um, uh, Sharzat, uh, Heather earlier mentioned that the West should engage with the Taliban and that they should deliver aid in smart ways um, to, to uh, uh, avert the humanitarian crisis from uh, getting worse. Um, there was a recent uh, video uh, um, shared on social media where this little girl is uh, saying that her mother is selling a kidney and uh, she also has a newborn for uh, the for whoever wants to purchase that so that the mother could feed the rest of the family. Um, uh, can you comment on um, you know what uh, the Western governments should do beyond expressing their deep concerns uh, uh, and you know just empty words? Uh, what do you have to say? Thank you. Um... Thank you, Farjan, for that question. Of course, in terms of uh, West's engagement, the national community's engagement as a whole, not just the West, um, Heather also laid out some really important points. And I absolutely agree that humanitarian aid should be sustained, but we should go beyond humanitarian aid. No one aspires to wake up every morning and queue up in a food line. This is, this, is, this is not the life people aspire to. People want to have income. People want to have employment. People won't have dignified lives. Uh, as, a, as a child, when I was younger, I remember the days when my family needed food assistance, but we didn't want to live like that. And I don't want to wake up in 2023 and still be talking about how urgent the humanitarian needs are and nothing beyond humanitarian aid. That's not a way the country can, can be run. That's not a way uh, for the Afghan people to live. So humanitarian aid should be sustained, of course, but all creative solutions should be utilized, as Heather was also talking about this, to make sure that there's liquidity back in the market. And of course, this doesn't mean lifting out, lifting, canceling all the sanctions. This doesn't mean giving money directly to Taliban, but many solutions have been put there. In fact, we, we can review the sanctions and look at them and see how they can be made more in line with human rights principles. 
Um, so there's a lot that can be done, but I do agree with Heather that that sense of urgency doesn't exist. There's not that sense of urgency about ending this misery. Look, it has been eight months. We shouldn't be talking about starving Afghans settling their children for food anymore. We should move on. We don't live in a world that can't afford to do better. Come on, we can afford to do better. Why are we not doing better? This is about the lives of millions of Afghans, including women and girls. Beyond that, beyond addressing the humanitarian situation and also the economic situation, trying to find creative ways to address that situation. And of course, there is an onus on Taliban to do more. Absolutely, Taliban have to do more about this, but they are not doing. And is international community exhausting all the creative solutions that are already on the table to avert this crisis? I don't believe so. So that, that, that needs to take urgency. In terms of engagement with Taliban, I personally think that we are not engaging with Taliban for the sake of Taliban. You know, that when we call on the international community to continue to engage with the Taliban, it's about continuing to keep the light on for millions of Afghans. It's about the fact that, that this part of the world cannot suddenly go dark and we can't all look away about what's happening there. Engagement with Taliban may or may not be productive. We have realized that it's not as productive as we all hoped, of course, it's much harder. Their own internal fragmentation is a challenge, but I do think that Taliban also think that the way by being stubborn and the, peace pro the so-called peace process, they got everything by just being stubborn, that that will happen again, that you know the scenarios for them is that we'll, we'll continue to be stubborn, we'll continue not to resolve our own internal differences about human rights issues. And then the international community will either just give in and recognize us like they did during the peace process, or they'll forget about us and leave us alone to do whatever we want to the women of Afghanistan. None of those should happen. They should not be recognized, but they should not also be left alone to run the country in this way. There should be continuous pressure, all forms of pressure to, to be used. When international community, when diplomats ask me, what leverage do you think we have on Taliban? I told them, you tell me, you sit down in meetings with them. What, do they, what are they asking you for? That's your leverage. They are asking you for recognition. They are asking you about sanctions. They are asking you about travel. They are asking you about you know, have, being invited, being recognized. That's your leverage. What are you using that leverage for? If you're using that leverage only for some vague counterterrorism purposes, which I think most of them probably think they are, then you don't care about the people of Afghanistan. You know, the human rights should be up there among the priorities that you're using that leverage for. And the rights of women and girls should be up there among the priorities that you're using the leverage for. So it's not a lack of leverage because Taliban do want things from the international community. Why do you think they announced that stupid, ridiculous, meaningless opium uh, cultivation ban? It's not, it's not practical. They know it, we know it, but they're doing it because they want to give something to the international community. So they, they care about what the international community wants. The question is, does the international community care enough to put enough resources? And sometimes this is about things like how many people are actually working on the Afghanistan desk, if there is an Afghanistan, Afghanistan desk in, in, in the US or the UK's government's foreign offices. And what skills and capacity these people have and to what extent they are spending time trying to figure out this, this question and this problem. Thank you, Sharzad. Um, it, it is very important to, again, repeat this, that uh, there is still a lot that the international community can do and should do uh, to help the people of Afghanistan and especially the women of Afghanistan, because we are living in 2022, where these types of human rights violation are absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and, and to... Uh, see the humanitarian catastrophe that people are living through, uh, it, it's mind boggling. How can we allow this to continue to happen? And so Dr. Samar, can you please talk about this a little bit? Um, how can uh, the international community support um, the women and girls beyond emergency measures? And also uh, you have worked uh, uh, with, uh, from your work with Shahada, uh, how do you assess emergency uh, 
challenges of the humanitarian crisis can be navigated specifically to help women in need and uh, while at the same time protecting an Afghanistan, uh, protecting and advancing their rights and freedoms. Dr. Samar, have we okay. lost her? Sorry, yes. Yeah. No, no, I'm here. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Farajan. And I, I think the on the international community, this is their obligation. They made the Taliban for us. If you look at the situation uh, um, again, started with aggression of the USSR on that time in Afghanistan. And then they choose these people and, and train. I worked, I mean, as Pashtana was saying, she was not in that time, but I, I lived through all of these governments. And I was working in, in a camp in Pakistan when they were building these madrasas for the Afghan children. On that time, it was the, the high, wall, five meter of wall and, and such a big door and big lock on the, on, the, uh, on the gate of that madrasa was saying a lot. And they ignored completely education. So those who were five or seven or eight year old on that time, I'm, I'm talking about 85, they are the most senior Taliban now. And they are the one who are ministers. So they have the obligation. The second point, I think, we had the experience of 9-11, as Heather said already, and that um, terrorist act, all people who participated and planned were not Afghans, but they were the one who been trained in Afghanistan. So that is showing that how, why Afghanistan is important for them and why they should have why they should still support us. On the uh, humanitarian crisis, unfortunately, since I, I know <laughs> during these years that I have been working with people, unfortunately, we are, most of the time we are in emergency cases, unfortunately. So this time, last time there was, uh, when it was a, a Taliban sanction put on the Hazara area, either you remember that, um, and they really stopped everything to go inside. People were really starving. And they started to, to um, take some food to Bamiyan airport. And then it was only one or two load of the small few metric ton of food to Bamiyan and then they shot the um, plane. So that was stopped. What we tried to say, we, we told the UN agencies in different other countries that, can you buy potatoes from the families who has and distribute it to another families from the local people? Uh, with Shuhada, what we did actually, we got very small amount of money from USAID on that time. We bought uh, wool from the families and we gave to another group of, so we gave some cash to the family. And it was very difficult to transfer cash. Of course, we were taking all risk, those risk in order to go inside. And then we were giving the, the wool to another group of women who were spinning it. So they were getting some, some cash. And the third group was making blankets and kilims. So the blankets and kilim were distributing to emergency cases, either if it was flood or returnees from Iran or, or Pakistan. Uh, um, or during the, the winter, very harsh winter, still it's very harsh. So that was kind of a injecting uh, cash to the family so they could survive and also a dignified way. Instead of be depending on the, on the food relief. Because as people keep saying that you should teach the people to uh, not to only to eat fish, fish, but also to, to catch fish. But I would say that make a pond for the people to grow fish and then catch it. Because we are teaching the people to eat fish and then uh, teaching them to even catch fish. And then there's no fish 
So how can they do, how can they fish and have fish for their family? So make a pond for the people in order to. So that's why I, I'm, I'm calling and I insist with the UN and other agencies that they should have a proper food for work and or cash for work program rather than only distributing relief program because the people should not be depend only on the, they can easily do a small handicraft family business. They can, uh, they can give some cash or some assistant to women to do that and then let them sell in the market. Um, to make yogurt, for example, to make cheese, for example, and I'm talking about Bamiyan and, and Baikundi areas, which I have more experience than the other countries. Maybe the other part of the country, maybe that is possible in Faryab and other. Kunduz, for sure, that is possible. In Baglan, it's possible. So there's a possibility that it can be done in Helmand and, and other parts of the countries. So it should be a proper thinking and a proper planning for that. And thank you so much, uh, Farangis John. I might leave around 11.30 because I have another thing. So, but I will be there until 11. Sure, sure. Not a problem. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that answer. Uh, Pashtana, uh, can I bring you back in? And uh, can you please comment on the region? How can we um, leverage their influence to advocate for um, the rights of women and girls, uh, especially the Muslim majority countries? I mean, we often tend to leave them completely out of the conversation, um, but, uh, uh, you know, do you think they have a certain responsibility to advance uh, this cause? And also, how can they support girls' education rights? And I would be um, glad if uh, others also would like to comment on that question. Thank you so much, Farajan, for the question. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, and it might be a very controversial take, but it's a very honest one. Um, Muslim majority countries don't care about Afghanistan. If they did, and they would have at least shown the sort of uh, attention or respect that um, Turkey or Qatar did for at least the airport that was being taken over the way uh, for the airport, and they have never even like you know given the same sense of urgency to girls' education. Now, don't get me wrong, Qatar's foreign minister, who is a woman, said a lot of stuff, um, invited a lot of Afghan women to Doha Forum, and which which is a good thing, but then it's not enough, right? Um, because the Taliban were in Qatar, their office is in Qatar, and um, there's a lot of things that Qatar could have done, but is not doing. Um, the second thing goes for Pakistan. I like to call them out uh, on very simple things. Um, they're okay with supporting the Taliban in madrasas. We all know that that's where their safe houses were. They're okay with staying in Karachi. Um, but at the same time, if we talk about girls' education, then somehow that was not a priority for the OIC, which was held in Pakistan. So let's start calling a spade a spade. Um, there was a, a, a demonstration for Masjid Al-Aqsa where people, the Muslims, actually uh, rose the flag for Taliban while the people of Afghanistan are suffering under the Taliban. So the Muslim countries have to start looking at the Taliban the way they are, oppressive regime who have actually burned murdered minorities, majorities, people in Afghanistan, still hunting down majority of the people, while um, people uh, tend to celebrate, or the Muslim countries tend to celebrate them as anti-imperialist group, which they are not, they are not. Not that we are very pro-America invading us. As I said, uh, they have used Afghan women again and again to justify their war and weaponize it the way they wanted it. And this is the reason that today there is so much gap between male and women uh, empowerment because most of the people see women empowerment as Western agenda and not as of their own. So you have to understand that the West has not played a very good role. But then at the same time, um, 
the Muslim countries, they have not shown the same sort of um, uh, sense of responsibility that they should have. The first thing that the Muslim countries could have done is the fact that Sharia, Islam, the Islam that we all as a shared religion believe in and follow says again and again that you're supposed to educate your daughters, right? And none of the Muslim countries have acted on it, but they were so okay with attending um, um, OIC meeting in Pakistan to support and legitimize. Um, so for me, I think it's very important countries like Turkey, countries like um, Qatar, countries like uh, Pakistan, uh, who have been openly uh, engaging with the Taliban should engage on that certain level when it comes to education and should actually send their own uh, figures and numbers to these Taliban and tell them that we're a Muslim country and this is how it's working in our countries and it's working perfectly fine for us. So why not for you guys? Um, that's very important. And most importantly, I think um, we have to understand the role of Muslim uh, countries that they have played in the past two decades. There were good Muslim countries who have stood by Afghanistan in the sense of in, the, in bad times, but majority of the times, uh, Afghanistan is always a last priority. Afghanistan is not seen as a priority. And also every time, um, girls education comes up every time women rights education or women rights comes up it somehow gives them the notion it's a western agenda well it's not it's how our culture is it's how our people are it's how everyone's country should be functioning in the 21st century you can't be expecting to do all that and you can't be experimenting that islam in afghanistan only while women in your country can roam around freely while women in your country can go to schools freely while women in your country can have access to universities freely but you won't experiment that extreme uh, islam or that extreme level of uh, religious persecution in my country because that's a lab for you, right? So I think religion has been used uh, uh, as a weapon by many countries, including Iran and Pakistan, for Afghanistan, and especially against Afghan women. And that's one thing I really want to highlight is the fact that Afghan women will never forgive that. They will remember the fact that these Muslim countries stood against the Muslim daughters or the Afghan daughters of Afghanistan, while Afghanistan is not a homogeneous only Muslim community. There are a lot of other religious minorities. They should not forget that. Um, we will not forget that and we will not forgive that because there were people who were stood up with us while the Muslim countries persecuted uh, activists on airports and they were not letting them out because they were Afghans. And Heather knows about that because I was the one who was being persecuted in a neighborly country for just being an activist. So I think it's very important that Muslim countries do understand that. If Dr. Nakamura from Japan can serve Afghanistan, it's it's their religious uh, uh, responsibility to act on it and make sure that women of Afghanistan access education because of the shared religion that we have. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that is indeed very insightful. And we cannot forget, no matter how much we try to, that we do live in a very interdependent world. And what happens in Afghanistan will directly impact uh, um, those living out in the West. I mean, this actually did happen in history. Let's not forget that. Uh, and and uh, um, I thank all of our speakers. And with that, I would like to turn over to take some of our audience questions. Um, so this is a very opportune that one of our audience uh, wants to ask the same question I wanted to ask Heather, uh, but uh, unfortunately did not have a uh, time. So Heather, you talked about uh, that there is still a lot the international community can do in terms of uh, delivering aid in smart ways and using their leverage to protect women and girls. Uh, so uh, can you talk a bit more about that? And also how can real uh, sustainable peace and development uh, be attained in Afghanistan with justice for and participation of women? Thanks so much. Um, well, first of all, um, peace and development will not be achieved as long as um, women are shut out of society. You can't um, you can't have a, a developing society when half of your population is not able to study, not able to work, not able to contribute to to their families and their societies, their communities. 
Um, so that's, you know, it's not just Afghan women and girls who have an interest in these abuses ending. It's every Afghan, including the Taliban, who will also suffer um, from the, the kind of destruction that they're causing to, to the future of their country. Um, in terms of aid and leverage, um, I think, um, I mean, as, as others have said, like humanitarian assistance is not the, the actual solution. Humanitarian assistance is saving lives and is urgently needed. And so, um, you know, no one's gonna argue against humanitarian assistance, but there's no substitute for having an economy. And Afghanistan at the moment doesn't have a functional economy. And so, and, you know, there are different, different um, ingredients that are needed to allow the economy to function. But one of the most important is uh, an economy can't function without a central bank. Um, and the Afghan central bank is, is not able to function because um, countries have withdrawn their recognition of the central bank. And having the central bank operate in a way where it's um, operating in a transparent way and there's oversight and there's um, you know, some clarity about how resources are being used is, is complicated. It is, and it probably requires international oversight or it requires um, you know, using an, an alternate bank as a, as a kind of replacement. Um, but there are solutions and people have been thinking hard about what these solutions are and what's been missing is, is this sense of urgency, this feeling that this has to be figured out immediately because um, failing to do so is killing people, um, which is the reality. Um, I, I wanted to, to sort of add on a little bit about like leadership in the international community because I think part of what's happened since August 15th is that the United States was, you know, was the 5 million ton gorilla in the room all the time for the last 20 years. They were the ones who were deciding what the international community was going to do in Afghanistan, what the military strategy was to a large extent, what the, the strategy for engaging with the government was, what the aid strategy was, and, and, and all of these other countries, which, you know, there were many other countries involved, but they, they to a large extent, just followed along and, and, you know, maybe tried to influence what the U.S. was deciding or just followed along and did what the U.S. said. And so I think after, <clears throat> after August 15th, a lot of these countries sort of went, okay, this seems like a big mess. Let's wait and see what the White House tells us to do about it. Um, and the, the White House, the, the US government just seems to have backed out of the whole thing and decided that they're not gonna be in charge. They don't want anything to do with it. It's not their problem. It's, a, it's an embarrassing mess they'd rather forget about. And that's left a, a sort of empty space where there's leadership that's needed. Um, and so in the last month or two, we have um, been trying to um, point out who we think ought to be filling that leadership void. And um, I'm going to pick on some specific countries, which are Canada, France, Germany, and Sweden. And the reason I'm picking on those countries is that they were among the many countries that sent troops that were super involved in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. But there's something else about them which is different, which is they are all countries that say that they have a feminist foreign policy. And I think that um, if having a feminist foreign policy doesn't mean that you stand up and you provide leadership and you make this an urgent priority at this moment, then possibly feminist foreign policy doesn't actually mean anything. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, uh, there are two questions about uh, girls' education, and I would like to um, direct them to Pashtana. Um, so, uh, one of our speakers, I think it was Dr. Samar, talked about the ability of girls to go to private schools. I mean, who are these students and what percentage of girls actually do go? Uh, and also, uh, while online education is better than no education, um, do you think uh, girls will receive support from home to be able to attend online school and actually afford them? Uh, and um, uh, are the Taliban, do they have any ways of controlling online education? Pashana? 
Thank you so much, Farajan. Um, I'm going to start with the private question, uh, private schools question, because we do partner up with a lot of private schools at the moment. And uh, the institutions that have reached out to us, those were communities led institutions that are functional within the houses. So I think uh, private institutions could be a good place to for the nonprofits or any of those uh, structures who are willing to educate girls to lend support to those institutions and make sure they do not charge for those specific classes like we don't so like for example an institution is um giving classes for English courses or computer courses or whatever, um, you come to an agreement and what we do is we give them laptops, we give them solar panels, we give them internet, we give them online te uh, teacher salary, we also send uh, facilitators and, and all that facility is only reserved for kids who cannot access education and girls who cannot access education from age 13 to age 18. And this is how we function in all the four provinces. And uh, I think it's a very good opportunity to be used. Um, I cannot go into specifics looking at the security, but I can tell you one thing that it could be one of those places that could actually challenge um, this complete ban on education. Um, second thing that uh, Kanan asked is like, um, uh, will they get uh, support enough from homes? Um, so as I told you, so uh, a normal day in our girls, uh, in our girls' life would be they go to uh, uh, this institution, uh, they log in, they get their uh, proper uh, schooling like biophysics, chemistry, Pashto, Dari, general sciences, general social studies uh, from our website where they can use it up until two hours and they uh, already have access to internet so they can go like, you know, take a physics lesson, take a chemistry lesson, do their assessments. And then there is one hour class for freelance uh, uh, classes where we teach them skills like uh, graphics designing, website development, coding. All that helps them in the long run to have uh, some sort of leverage in their family and start earning money. And that's what Code to Inspire does too. So do check their work and uh, you can go to our website and check our work. It's very easy to follow. We provide these facilities because we know that homes cannot sometimes afford laptops or 150 bucks internet for a single girl. So we do it on community level. In a country that is right now starving, it's very, um, hard to uh, push for stuff like that. But then at the same time, I also want to highlight the fact what Heather said is that all these countries who say that we have feminist policies, none of them, not a single one of them have assigned any funding to these alternative learnings, to all these uh, online schools, to all these approaches that are being done by me or Angela Rayur or by uh, Code to Inspire or by, Sha uh, by Shabana. None of them have done, none of them have been supported in all of this. And this makes me wonder, are they even serious about girls' education? Because as educators, we have to continue to fight the good fight. And as Afghan women, this is my responsibility to do that. But the international community is not doing anything right now. They're not focusing on any of the solutions. They're not responding to any of the urgencies. I have been in contact with the special envoy for the past three months, and they continue getting me in touch with people who are like, you know, you have to apply for citations. I don't want to apply for a grant proposal. I'm not working on a project. I'm not a corporate project person. I'm not running a corporate NGO. I'm working in a country that is banned girls from going to school. There is a difference between it. You should be assigning funds to that. Um, for the past 20 months, I have been working with Starlinks to get Afghanistan a satellite. And I'm so near of getting this. And even with that, um, uh, the one thing that I see again and again is the fact that it's private sector, it's people like us who are actually focusing on satellite, on free internet, on asking and begging all these big corporations to send laptops to Afghanistan, and all these people who are, are internationally claiming to champion girls' education are not doing anything. So on community level, we do have good models to follow. On international level, they're not being supported. And that's the reason those are not able to mass scale or be able to work more. And last but not the least, I would just want to highlight is the fact that we are right now um, also in a partnership with a radio, Radio Azadi, that will be running classes in Pashto and Dari to educate the girls who cannot even access internet in the long run or cannot come to those small packs of schools anywhere else. So 
there are good efforts in place. It's just who is willing to invest in them, focus on them and prioritize them. Thank you so much, Pashtana. Um, um, uh, as you have said, as Heather has said, there is still a lot the international community can do uh, to help women and girls in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, what we're witnessing is that defending basic human rights has become politically motivated. And we still have a lot of leverage over the Taliban. And there are still a lot of smart ways to help girls uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, uh, and so with that, I want to uh, ask Sharzad, uh, you have shared uh, that uh, you were forbidden to attend, attend school under Taliban in the 90s until your family was forced to flee for Pakistan. What advice would you give uh, Afghan girls that are feeling just completely hopeless, uh, feeling like their future is taken away from them? And what do you think our Western audience should know what it is truly like for the millions of girls and women currently living under under the brutal uh, Taliban regime. Thank you. I think for the girls, I really I really don't feel like an, I'm in a position to have any advice for them. I, I just have so much love and, and and so much sorrow that I can't do more. It, it, it kills me every day that that millions of Afghan women, uh, Afghan girls can pursue an education. That's a basic right, it's an Islamic right, it's a human right. It's, and, and we are all failing them because we can't, they have already missed so much school. I, I, really, I really don't think I can have any advice, honestly. Um, what saved me um, during the Taliban regime and the years of war and conflict was books, was reading, but that was because my, my family, you know, my parents um, love books and had access to ways to find books for us, but that's that's very very rare, and that that's not that's not the solution for anyone. It, the schools really should open. So, I, I I don't I don't know. It's it's there. Are, we have seen a lot of problems in, in our lifetime, growing up in, in conflict, growing up in poverty, growing, living as refugee. This is the second time for me to become a refugee. But this problem right now with women's education in Afghanistan, it's it's something that I'm grappling with every day. And, and it's something that has made me mo feel most uh, powerless. Um, but what gives me hope is the fact that the girls will keep pushing and they will use any, any even small window of opportunity. Um, to, to pursue an education. And I do hope the world and we all um, don't fail them and, and, and somehow find ways for them to return to school. I think in terms of what does it feel like, you know, what does it feel like to be a woman in Afghanistan? This is not unique to the Taliban period. Since, since I realized who I was, that I was a girl, there were so many people every day that made me feel like being born a girl is a crime. Now that has been amplified. Now that has been intensified. Now all Afghan women are being told on a daily basis, you are less than a man because you're a woman, because you're a girl, you're less than a boy. You can't even go to school. Your brother can, but you can't. Because somehow you have committed something we don't know just by being a woman. You know, women are made, like, made to feel like criminals every day. They are being prosecuted for their gender every day which is why what's happening in Afghanistan is a gender apartheid it's a form of discrimination so systematic so overwhelming so unfair and unjust so cruel that if it was happening to any other category of people so intensely in such large numbers surely the world would be doing more surely surely I mean it's unbelievable it's 2022 and women are being punished for being women every single day and I'm in my country. Girls or girls are being punished. 12 year girls are being punished. And what's the response? Thank you so much um, uh, for that very candid response. And uh, uh, yes, it is uh, truly made to feel that it is a shame 
to be a girl in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we had reversed so much of that patriarchy over the past 20 years and uh, all of those uh, very hard earned efforts are now regressing. And, uh, but we cannot let that happen. And uh, it is uh, through important work that you all of, uh, all of you do uh, that should keep the attention on this very uh, pertinent and important issue. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for joining me today. Thank you to our audience for their participation. Uh, and uh, I wish you all uh, very well. And we all send Afghan girls lots of love and to remain strong uh, because change is coming. Thank you so much.